Welcome back to the Veterans Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program. We're ready to begin our first panel, Veteran Innovators and Their Journeys with IP. At this time, I have the distinct honor and privilege of introducing our veteran and military spouse panelists. Barbara Kent is a U.S. Army veteran and founder and CEO of Birdie Boutique. Nick Ripplinger is a U.S. Army veteran and president of Battlesite Technologies. And Kevin Shirley is a U.S. Air Force Reserve veteran and co-founder of American Soul Brothers. Welcome. Why did you become an innovator and entrepreneur? I've always known that I wanted to continue to work, but I had to find something super flexible. I have a family, I have a husband who's still active duty, we're moving every couple of years. Having a business was the right answer. I have a very flexible schedule and I can work on my own time, so it's just worked out really well. Excellent. Nick, same question. My military career kind of got cut short due to some medical issues and starting battle site was kind of a way for me to stay in the fight. You know, there's plenty of men and women still in, you know, harm's way. And, you know, I kind of felt like my time there got cut short. So started Battlesite as a way to continue to support those brave men and women still out there fighting. Kevin? For me, it was more like, what can I do that's greater than myself? I was so unfulfilled working just day to day. And I said, this is the perfect time now to go for it. How did your military service help prepare you to succeed in business? You know, I utilized the GI Bill and finished my undergrad, got a master's degree. but you know, I'm always looking back on the military career more so than any of those classes I ever took or pieces of paper I earned. And I really think it boils down to problem solving. Every single day, there's something that comes up and, you know, being a business owner, founder, whatever you want to call it, there's always problems or unforeseen stuff, no matter how much you plan. And just having that adaptability and flexibility that we're taught in the military to kind of keep pushing forward and finish the mission and those skills, I think, you know, get deployed every single day in my professional life. Thank you for that, Nick. It's a great answer. Kevin, uh, same to you. How do you think your military service helped prepare you to succeed in business? It's the discipline and the camaraderie. You know, when I first got my first contracting job, you know, I had all my resumes and like, like, you, like Nick's got there saying, all my resumes out there, I'm so proud of the things I've done. The guy that hired me at the time, he pushed all that aside and said, you're a retired veteran. Your discipline, and I know you're coming here and you get the job done. That is how I got most of all my jobs in the last decade of working in corporate or anywhere else. You're a veteran because you know your discipline. You're going to come in and do what you're supposed to do. That is what the veteran community brings for all of us, and it helped me personally. Thank you for that, Kevin. Barbara? I think the biggest thing that I learned in the military is to adapt and to overcome. I learned that anything that's thrown at me, I can handle. I can figure out, like Nick said, I can figure out a solution. Um, because there are really many different ways to get to the same result. And I've learned that um, in business. When someone tells you no, it's not necessarily a no. You just have to figure out a different way to get to the same solution. And there's always a different way. So, Excellent. Thank you for that. This is for Barbara and Kevin. Why did you choose to obtain trademarks? The first thing that we did was, what is your logo? Your logo has to mean something to you. And once we figured that out and our logo represented who we were as a company, as human beings, you know, if I tell everybody they see American Soul Brothers and they look at a, you know, this logo looks like Soul Train or something like that with all the colors and all that kind of stuff. But when I go in and I do presentations, I'll say, you know, we all are American and the center is your soul. At the end of the day, we're brothers and sisters, the American Soul Brothers. That's what that means. And so when we got that concept and we really live by that and we treat people how you want to be treated, it's part of our company logo, relationships over transactions. All of that is intertwined in that logo. Now you want to really protect that. And so now we went in and just started doing our trademarking with our marketing team first and the lawyers. You have to get all those folks on board. And they showed us how to do that. So we had to compete with Soul Train. You know, I think Oprah Winfrey had one of those logos. We had to change some wordings around. And we figured that out. Now our heart is in it now. And so now we said, we're going to get this trademark so we can own this name. We're going to do a lot with American Soul Brothers, and we had to go to our lawyers for like a year to learn how to do it. Submitting all those documentations, you know, waiting till everything got approved. You know, every little thing, every little line drawn differently, just one way to the left or the right makes a difference. We had no idea what goes in the trade market. And when we did that, now we're proud of what 
it took almost two years to get solidified. You know, it's our trademark. It means it's who we are. And when I go tell even some people in the Bunkers Lab, I'll tell this to in the veteran community. When you get your logo and you get something where your heart and you're passionate about, oh my God, that is the trademark. That's who you are. You're trademarking who you are inside. And I get up and talk about this. I get chills when I talk about, it, especially being, you know, your soul is in the center. That's what you want trademarking that you own. Now we go help others with American Soul Brothers. But it took two years. Marketing, attorneys, those two institutions you have to have to get your trademarking. And it takes a long time to do it, a lot of disappointments, but when you get it, now you're out there talking about who you are, your heart's on the line there. And I tell you, it's rewarding to see people see that logo and go, oh man, what is that? What does that mean? And I go through my spiel. The soul is in the center. That's what trademarking is why it's so important. It's who you are. Trademark you, your heart. Appreciate that, Kevin. Thank you very much. Uh, Barbara, I want to ask you the same question for your trademark. If you could kind of take us through why you thought that was an important piece um, in order to protect your business. So we trademarked our business name um, and several of our product lines because that to us meant that now we really own those names and those lines. No one else can use them. So when you hear the word learning blankets, they're ours. No one else can have those blankets. Um, and we've had several cases of um, online platforms where other folks were trying to use our name and it was so unbelievably easy to get them to remove those because we have the we, we are the owners of that name. So that was I highly recommend that um, anybody that's thinking about it that they do that. Um, it's a huge wall of protection for us. The other thing that I wanted to say is it's kind of like a stereo stereotype. Um, the aspect for me that's important is that the trademark makes my business and my products more credible. Um, it, in a way, it shows that my business is serious and that I'm in it for the long run, not, not just for a couple of years. Really excellent point there, Barbara. This question is for Nick. Why did you choose to file for a patent? So I always joke around about, you know, one day when we sell Battlesite, I'm going to sit down and write the book called Battlesite, the story of dumb luck. But uh, I was kind of burnt out in corporate America. I just closed a big uh, merger and ended up resigning the same day that we closed that deal and was a little bit lost professionally as to what I was going to do next. And I had a great mentor of mine kind of pitch us on this idea of this Air Force technology. So Air Force Research Labs developed something. They patented it, basically went and sat on a shelf. Nothing was really going on with that technology. That technology, I would have been a customer for that piece of technology back in my military days. So we actually executed a patent license agreement with the Air Force to take that uh, piece of technology out of the lab. And that was really the creation of Battlesite. We built this company around this one piece of technology back in 2017. Um, it's been an interesting ride since then. We've executed another patent license agreement with the Air Force to create another product line pulled in some university uh, technology from the University of Georgia to kind of round out the defensible stuff that uh, Barbara was just mentioning about how important it is to protect it. And then we've had all these different variations. Like he mentioned, I think we've got three or four issued patents now and another, I don't know, half a dozen to a dozen of them in the pipeline. So it's, we really went from no idea what I was going to do at all to acquiring a piece of technology from the Air Force to kind of building out our own research and development, which led to us, you know, filing our own patents. So it's, I think when you think of patents, it's very, like, there's a lot of different tentacles to that octopus, but so many people focus on the one of, you got to come up with a great idea that's novel, and I forget all the other requirements because I'm not an IP attorney, but there's, you know, several requirements to file that patent, but there's also other ways to still get into that innovation space if you don't have that next great invention. That's a great point. I've been working with entrepreneurs for many years, and I've met a few of you folks that were formed. Um, the company was created out of a licensing agreement. It's very rare. I don't think that it's utilized as much as it should be. I think um, we need to do a better job of letting entrepreneurs know that, hey, you don't literally need to invent something overnight. Um, somebody else may have already come up with that great idea, but they don't have the vision or the resources to bring it 
it to fruition, to make it a reality. And your example is perfect where you stepped in, you saw what they had created, you approached them, you asked them for the licensing rights, and then you took the ball and ran with it and were so successful that it actually uh, was the launching point for a business you had no intention to start. I mean, it's it's a great story. Appreciate you sharing that. Can I add one more thing to that, Ed? Absolutely. I think, you know, Kevin and Barbara and our conversations with you before this kind of hit on it, like veterans are poised to be phenomenal entrepreneurs for so many different reasons. And I think we all kind of covered different reasons there that this patent license, you know, kind of business play is so underutilized where I think, especially in the veteran community, we got to do a better job of kind of promoting this and getting that out there because it, it could have such a massive impact, especially when you already have the skills to go build that company around a piece of technology. What resources did you leverage to transform your vision into a successful business? We started our business strictly online. We we're on several online platforms and that's where we were selling our products. Um, I, I would say that the resource that was, had the major impact that moved us from online onto retail shelves were the organizations that certified us as veterans and women-owned businesses. Um, those, those organizations are by far such an amazing and massive pool of, pool of um, information. I cannot even uh, explain to you how much help and advice uh, they've given to us. Um, the other big thing that may, many people might not realize is that they also put you in contact with possible customers, possible mentors, um, people that you may want to work with. So um, anything you can do to expand your net network is, is amazing, but these organizations are definitely by far my favorite. Um, the other thing that I wanted to bring up is LinkedIn. We just started ourselves on LinkedIn this year, and we have built so many relationships and uh, grown our network so much just by looking people up and seeing what they do and seeing what their interests are and just connecting with those folks in the same industry. So I would highly suggest uh, utilizing those. Thank you very much, Barbara. Yeah, of course, social media always plays a vital role uh, in any small business. And there are resource partners out there that are available that can take a small business owner who may not be uh, savvy in that arena and train them up on how to use LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, those type of things to engage, uh, but also to find new clientele. So you raised a very good point there. Thank you. Kevin, want to uh, let you address the same question now. Well, we were more like boots on the ground. That's how we started. It was an idea and a dream. And then we had to get boots on the ground. Literally, that's what we did. So we had our family and friends, we got boots on the ground. We had to prove and show our passion to people who are watching us and say, are you really serious about a sauce? You know how competitive that is? We say, yeah, it is, but we got a dream. We got passion. You know, we're going to do it. We're determined, you know, and so now just like uh, Barbara saying, you know, you meet these uh, organizations, these certifications that helped as well as the journey started, but the boots on the ground was probably the most significant because everybody, all the relationships I made, it's really relationships over transactions I made over the years, it came full circle. And they saw your passion that we boots on the ground, meeting people, going from knocking on doors, basically stores. We started meeting these different retail chains just by just walking in there and just introducing ourselves. Showed them a bottle, got them back to one meeting, you know, never meet a distribution company. You know, we didn't know what that was. Distribution is how you get your product in these retail markets. But I know what distribution was. You go in there and get opportunity with those guys. And you just go for it. We did that. We get two stores. Then you get 30. Then you end up with 60. And you look up, you're in 100 stores, just like that. You know, and you learn as you go, you know, as you meet people, they see your passion. They take the time to show you and train you and teach you. They see you have an attorney and marketing again. That's crucial. Attorney and marketing. When they saw we had that, now they gave us the keys. You know, we give you guys a shot. So we go and knock on somebody else's door. And about, say, maybe 10 years of boot, boots on the ground is how we got to where we are now. And the relationships we made in the beginning is now supporting us to this day. Just like Barbara said with LinkedIn. You get on you know, sites like that. And people see your progression over, you know, two years, six, now eight, and you didn't quit. You're still moving and you're determined. When they see you making progress, now you get another person out of the blue that'll come and support you. And that's how American Soul Brothers pretty much has survived these last over 10 years. Boots on the ground, proving ourselves to people on both coasts. You know, I left and moved away, you know, from coast to coast, just living on cots. 
and people saw that determination. And now we're sitting here with folks on our team that I never thought I'd ever meet as mentors of all shades. And the one thing they look at, you're an Air Force veteran. That sticks out, I mean, like a golden ring when people see my resume and our company. Veteran owned and Air Force, by the way, which I think is great. But they love veterans. You know, that has been such a bonus for us. Kevin, you brought up a good point that um, that Barbara had raised, which was the certification, government certifications for contracting opportunities. Uh, in her case, a woman-owned small business, a veteran-owned small business. Um, Kevin, you were sharing a little something with us. I'd like you to share it with the audience uh, before we started. You have an opportunity coming up with um, a government agency. Could you speak to that? Yep, that's again, boots on the ground and building relationships. You know, relations over transaction. We look at people that they're a human being, not a wallet, and they're now an opportunity to actually live and breathing human being. That has been a success for us. And so now that I've, I got involved in some golf uh, PGA world, where we're selling it with the golf world now, which I never thought would happen. I'm at the PGA show and I, I got in some hotels and things of that nature. Since I've done that and go to events, I'm on council events now, where I can help other small business on these golf councils that I'm a part of now. I met someone that got me introduced to the uh, VA, some uh, different merchandisers there. And so now I talk to the national merchandisers. And so now I got opportunity with the Department of Veterans Affairs, you know, just like that. And so now I got to prove myself again, the boots on the ground and go do all the VAs in the Southeast region. You know, the opportunity is going to be getting started with Atlanta. And that's how you prove yourself. Your character will show once I get in there in that kiosk and serve veterans, which that, that's just uh, icing on the cake. But I do have opportunity with the Department of Veterans Affairs now, which opens up doors for other folks maybe later. So I'm very proud and happy about that. But it wouldn't have happened without the boots on the ground. You know, it may happen different for somebody else, but for us, it was boots on the ground, knocking, pleading, begging, seeking. And that's how we got to this point. For American Soul Brothers to be in food service and retail. That's people just can't believe it when they see us there, you know. But we tell them, you want to know the story? It's how we got there, boots on the ground. But a veteran definitely helps. That's the key Thank you to for that, Ken. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thank you for sharing that with us and yeah. congratulations. The VA is uh, that could send you into a whole new stratosphere. Yeah. So kudos to you on that. Uh, Nick, I want to offer you the opportunity to answer the same question. What resources did you leverage to transform your vision into an actual successful small business? Yeah, absolutely. And I can God, I give like a three day talk on this. Um, <laughs> I, we, we utilize every resource we could. And I think that it all started with, you know, kind of checking your ego at the door, right? I'm not an expert at probably anything, but definitely not all the aspects of business. And, you know, how if you want to be successful, you got to pull on that expertise. And, you know, starting out, we didn't really have the money to go hire that expertise. So we leaned heavily on, you know, external resources, such as, you know, personal mentors who've been there for me for decades. We utilized IVMF out of the University of Syracuse. They were a massive, massive resource for now that they've got programs for every stage from ideology to launching to growth. Um, they've been a massive resource to us. And then I think the biggest thing is just the network, right? We all can walk into a room of veterans and there's no barriers. And there might be, you know, a lawyer who's a veteran who's an expert at trademarks or a lawyer that's great at um, patents or you know, I'd love to pick Barbara's brain on the online marketing that she's been wildly successful with. And when you can knock down those barriers, your network is so wide. It's, you know, international. And, you know, just, you know, putting yourself out there and not being afraid to say, hey, I really don't understand this. Who do I know that understands this that can kind of help me not make the same mistakes that maybe they made or that they know somebody else has made? And just, you know, trying to be smart about it and not make mistakes that are preventable. You raise a couple of great points there, Nick. What advice would you give to other veterans and military spouses who are interested in starting a business and protecting their intellectual property? I think the first thing is, is get out of your own head. All right, make a decision. Are you gonna do it or not? Very simple, yes, no question. And then if you decide to just go out and violently execute to the best of your ability, lean on your resources, don't be afraid to ask for help and just do it. I, the only regrets I have really in life are, you know, actions I didn't take. So don't let this, you know, don't be 60, 70 years old thinking, what if? Just go out and do it. I have to agree with Nick. I mean, yeah, what, what are you passionate about? 
is yes or no. Are you willing to go in 100 percent? It can't be halfway in, 100 percent in. And then you make sure who, is, who are the people that will support me? Who is my support group? And we talked about before the mentors. You have to have mentors that tell you what you don't want to hear. You know, so now we got a group of mentors that are all different ages, all different backgrounds. They tell us what we don't want to hear. We want to go faster and they slowed us down. And so now that has been beneficial to us. Mentors, what are you passionate about? What is your plan? Can I see myself in two years doing one, two, three? If you could see that and have the passion to step out and have the courage and get out of your own way, that is what I would advise anybody that's thinking about doing a business. Move your ego out of the way and what are you passionate about? Once you do that, then take the next step. Who can I go that's successful at this? They can mentor me and tell me what I don't want to hear. That's the hard part. Somebody tell you what you don't want to hear. And they'll tell you, you know, the slowest you go, that's the most successful folks that take the slow road, not the fast road. And I used to hear that over and over and over again. I didn't like it, but it was true. And they're still my mentors today. Dennis Gilliam, Tim Ridgway, I can go down the list and name these people. Our lawyers, Jesse Lyons, all these folks told me that. I didn't want to hear it at the time, but boy, it has paid off now. Slow down. That's a successful road. Barbara? I think that if you're thinking about starting a business, I will say the same thing that uh, that Nick said. Just do it. Just jump in. I know that it's easy to get in your head and say, oh, I have to do this and I have to plan this and I have to make this perfect and I have to make this just right. Nothing will ever be perfect and you will not know everything that you have to get done. So just start it and the rest you're going to learn along the way. I'm still learning every single day after nine years of doing this. I'm learning every single day. So my advice is just go, just go and do it. And with regards to protecting your intellectual property, do it today. Because unfortunately, if you don't, somebody else will take it away from you. What is the one takeaway you want our audience to know? Remember that you are not going to be in this by yourself. There are so many resources for veterans out there. There are so many organizations. Uh, so many classes, so many things that you can do to make yourself smarter and make yourself better. Um, just don't fall into the trap of thinking that I can't do it because I don't know how to. There's there's help out there. So um, definitely know that and uh, also start building your network right away. Uh, people in the industry, mentors, uh, people with like businesses, um, those are the things that are going to get you through it and that's where you're going to learn. I have to agree with Barbara. It's the same way, you know, when you step out and just do it and you'll learn when you step out on faith like that, people want to see you succeed. And you'll go to some of these events like that and you'll be amazed who willing to help you when they see the passion that you have. They want to help you. And, uh, and all the resources are there in your own community, right in your own city. And those certifications and those LinkedIn networking events, those are really important to go to. And you'll find out people have some commonalities just like you. They're trying to strive. You know, you meet other entrepreneurs that can encourage you. But the, the, the community, those folks really want to see you succeed. And I learned that by lawyers and marketing. And I, I never thought those folks work with small people like us to be successful as they are. But they saw the passion. If you got passion, we're willing to help you if you show us that you're really serious about it. That's the advice I would give. Just step out and do it and don't be afraid. There's people out there that really will support you when they see the passion on you. And I think it's been said by everybody somewhere throughout this presentation, but lock down your intellectual property. It is so expensive to get into an IP fight. You know, trademark your brands, trademark your products, patent, you know, as much as you can, like within the confines of the law, of course. But seriously, you need to protect yourself in this. There are so many resources out there that can help you, like everybody's mentioned. But there's also for every resource out there, there's somebody there trying to knock you off. So just make sure you protect yourself as much as possible. What are the greatest challenges facing your business today? And are you prepared to face them? It's, it's always challenges. You know, I can go down the list and name a hundred of them. You know, because like we're just talking about with the uh, patent and, you know, and the trademark, you got to pay your attorneys, you know, that's important. But our biggest thing now is just keeping production, you know, production made, you know, online. You know, we got more accounts than we have capital to produce product. That's one of our biggest Achilles heel that we have to go through pretty much daily. But we have people now that are interested to kind of support us financially, you know, maybe venture capitalists or you got other, you know, institutions. But that's our biggest problem for our you know, kind of business. It's always production. You know, and you have people coming to you, let be a Costco or anybody large like that, and you can't make the product. So sometimes that kind of depresses us. And then we get out and start meeting people and somebody, you know, offers glimmer, a glimmer of hope like we do right now to this day. So you won't give up. You know, there's people out there that will support you once they see you've established something like we have. So 
that's your question is product production. You know, that's what our biggest Achilles heel right there. Manufacturing. Sounds like we got to work on helping you get a, a line of credit there so you can keep <laughs> those orders rolling, right? Exactly. That's correct. We'll, we'll get to work on that, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, Barbara, same question. I think our biggest hurdle right now is to establish manufacturing here in the US. We it's so easy to manufacture overseas, but it is not as easy to manufacture here. We're trying to manufacture in Michigan. We're in the works with a couple of companies already. Um, unfortunately, the price tag is extremely high, so that's that competitive edge is, is kind of running away from us. Uh, but we'll continue to work with them and, and see where we end up. We're also attempting to work with a lot of uh, recycled fabrics, uh, basically fabrics made from recycled plastics. That's where a lot of the textile industries is moving towards. That's where the customers are moving, so we kind of have to move with them. Um, so research into that has been difficult um, in establishing the, that, that process of, one, how to get your materials from the products that you want, but then also how to, are those products that you make, are, are they going to be recycled into something else? And, and if they are, how so? Uh, that's the level of detail that we're having to work with. Thanks for that, Barbara. Uh, Nick? Yes, I had the benefit of, you know, having a couple minutes to think on this while everybody else answered. And I really, I can't pick one. I kind of got it narrowed down to two. And one is supply chain with everything seems to be upside down in this world right now. And it's getting a little bit better, but still, something we spend a lot of time and energy working around to get in the raw materials to make product. And then the second is kind of the labor market with everything going on, talent recruitment and, you know, talent retainment are, you know, huge priorities for us. We're a small team. So if you lose one person, it's, you know, you feel a big effect on that. Yep. And, you know, I think, you know, as a you know former NCO, right, you always want to take care of your people and you know the dollars just not going as far as it did, you know, a few years ago. And you know, really trying to balance that. How do you take care of your people while still, you know, keeping the company, you know, financially afoot to, you know, still employ them in six months. So I guess that's really three. I kind of went down, but I'd say those are the three big challenges we're facing and trying to solve on a daily basis right now. If you were starting your entrepreneurial journey today, what is the one thing you would do differently and why? You know, I think I would have started sooner and it kind of went back to one of the earlier questions you asked of, you know, get out of your own head and just go and execute. And, you know, I debated for probably upwards of a year. Is this really what I want to do? Like the passion was there. The knowledge was there. The technology was there. I should have started in 2016 instead of 2017. I would have been more bolder a lot sooner. It's like Nick said, a lot bolder. I would have tried to forecast more what manufacturing means. What does that, what does that entail? How much would that cost? You know, plan for that prior to jumping out in the middle of the ocean. You know, I've done that first. You know, finding out more about how the marketing, I mean, the trademarking works. You know, the trademark all of our product lines. You know, that would have saved us a lot of time and money, labels, money spent for labels, all those things I would like to redo again. But I've been much more bolder. So I, I, if I could go back and do it again, that is exactly what I would do and approach folks with more confidence instead of being timid like we were in the beginning. You know, so that's probably what I would say. I am saying the same thing as Nick and Kevin. I should have started earlier and I should have prepped less because we were trying to prepare all the onesies and twosies of of these listings and these products and make them perfect and make this perfect and in the end it really didn't matter it just mattered that we started because we learned through stumbling along the way and we learned our lessons and we got better so i would have definitely started faster and i would have definitely made some of some of those decisions on on the big moves faster because those were always very intimidating but i um i would have just jumped and done it faster I'm, I'm sensing a common theme here amongst our <laughs> panelists today. Yeah. Faster, quicker, sooner, and uh, yeah, just dive right in, right? Um, I guess, you know, everything happens for a reason. You all did it the way you did it. Uh, you know, you thought that that was the right way to do it for you at the time. But looking back, um, you know, I, to your point, earlier point, Barbara, I think if you keep working towards it has to be perfect 
you'll you'll never get there, right? You'll never get there, and it's it's one step forward and two steps back. Um, so really, it's just get it out there, prove that it works, right? Find the problem, identify the solution, and and just go with it and see who's willing to um, embrace your vision, your journey, and then help you along the way whether it's through a resource partner or a mentor or a bank providing a line of credit, um, because all of those are integral parts in making sure that you're a successful entrepreneur at the end of the day. Yeah. So at this time, I wanted to um, sort of open it up to the panel to, for you guys to discuss anything that's important to you or something big that's on your radar or something that you feel um, you would want to share with our audience today that uh, might be a critical takeaway for them. So this time I'll give Nick a little time to think and I'll uh, we'll start with Kevin on that. Kevin, anything that you'd like to anything you'd like to impart upon our audience at this point? I would say, you know, just like Barbara's talking about when we were talking about being bolder, you know, and things take longer and you said things happen for a reason. If I hadn't made the choices I've made, I never would have met the team of people that I've met that's helping me right now on my mentorship team. You know, whether it be attorneys, lawyers, you know, supply chain directors, all these kind of folks. They saw the downside. And so now that's actually was a blessing in disguise. You know, I, I could say that. So everything happens for a reason. We stay on the path that we're on. I would say, you know, I like having veterans connect with each other like we're doing right now. I think it's a whole lot into this community that we hadn't tapped into, like we're, on, like we're talking right now. It's some things I could help some veterans and they can help me as well. I think if we really partner and help each other, we could really go far versus putting all our, you know, eggs in one basket, depending on the corporate world. How about the military community? You know, so since joining Bunkers Lab, this has taught me how we could do more together. We have more in common than not, and we all trying to achieve the same thing. If you go in different directions, that's even better. You know, so I want to do more of that in the military community, you know, and kind of stay in touch, you know, kind of you know, engaged and share the people I know and the things that I'm, I'm learning and where I'm growing, like U.S. foods, all this national distribution I'm getting, you know, things like that, the golf, the PGA world, all this kind of stuff, I'm making a part on someone else, you know, so I'm very grateful for this opportunity. I hope we can kind of stay in touch and do things together, you know, kind of, kind of broaden this out a little bit more. So I think if it's your time, Ed, thank you for doing it. I would say the biggest thing is don't let anybody tell you no. So if you, if someone says, you know what, I'm going to make a sauce and, and someone says there's a lot of sauce out there. Mm -mm. If you love the sauce, if you love it, do it. I personally love education. I, I feel like education has got me to where I am and it's given me so many opportunities. So my products are full of educational themes. I, people have told me there are so many blankets out there. Why are you making blankets? I'm like, you know what? Because my blankets are special. And I think they do something for people. They motivate and they inspire. And I went after it. So don't let anyone tell you no, because there is there's always a way to make it done, to make it to get it done. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. use my last couple minutes to kind of go back to the last question that we were talking about. I think it's so important that it shouldn't be glossed over. And Ed, you hit on it. Barbara, you hit on it. Kevin, you hit on it. And you know, 80% solutions our home runs in this game of entrepreneurship, right? It doesn't have to be perfect, right? Get Gen 1 out there, taking that customer feedback and, you know, go and revise for Gen 2. And it kind of goes back to something we've all echoed is just go out there, put yourself out there and do the work. And I think that's, you know, the big takeaway from all this from my own standpoint is you just have to be an, an excellent doer. And, you know, we've got a neon sign in our shop that says violently execute as soon as you walk in just to remind everybody that's what we're here every day for. And, you know, we make mistakes and we don't hit, you know, home runs every time, but, you know, those 80% solutions, get it out there, collect feedback and iterate. Hey, that's a great point. Thing, Absolutely. Thing. Jump in. Listen, cause this, listen to these two guys. They, this is you know, encouraging me to listen to both of them. Naysayers are people who can really bring you down and kill your dreams. When we started building our company, you, know, you can't do that. I mean, there's too much out there. You're not going to make that. And we first started, we got films and videotape we did and, and photographs. We went in there and showed folks on those shelves. The shelves were empty. And we did that for several months and years. And we said, now why the naysayers told us no, but our product's selling. You know, that's why having that trademark is so important because we had jealousy involved and wanting to bring you down. 
but naysayers can kill a dream. I say, if you hang around those folks, you'll never get anywhere. The folks that you see here now, Bob or Nick, these are the folks you want to be talking to, not naysayers who don't have a dream at all. So I would say stay away from those folks. That's one good lesson I would say as I try to build our company. Could you tell me about your experience as you transitioned out of the military into the civilian world? So I already had an idea about what I want to do. So I looked at the Veterans Affairs was one of the jobs I wanted to get. You know, I had a job already. I had kind of prepared. But my cousin who owned a contracting company, a very successful guy, and he let me come and, you know, and join his company. And it, all he wanted to see is that I was a veteran. He didn't care about anything else. You're a veteran. And he hired me on the spot. And that's why I learned how contracting work and going to D.C., meeting politicians and things like that. I said, if my cousin can do something like this, I can do it. The seed was planted really with him. So three years of contracting with him, soliciting contracts, you know, going to D.C., seeing how politics work and all that kind of stuff. I said, man, if I could do that myself and bring in people like me, that would be a huge goal for me and a dream come true. And so I left that company actually making that kind of money. Like Nick said, you know, you'd be in the corporate world, but something was missing there. And so all my family thought I was crazy to leave a corporate job with all that money to go with some sauce that you don't know what's going to do. What's going to happen with this sauce in a bottle? And you're going to leave this corporate job flying on a trip to D.C.? Are you crazy? Gave all my stuff away, and I just did it. You know, and I can look back now. Those three years of contracting helped me with my cousin that I've known my entire life. I said, this guy's successful. If he can do it, I can do it. So I left there, and I always keep him in mind as when I went out for the first time to Maryland, to Fort Meade, with nothing. And traveling the country, they're sleeping on cots, you know, broke. And I said, I can be just like my cousin someday. And now I'm talking to him now as one business owner to another. We just talked last week. He owns a business, I own a business. He's telling me now you need to lease a car, don't buy. So now we got a relationship like that. And he respects the grind, what you did, leaving that company with him with all that money, hanging out on farms, having a good time versus doing it yourself. And he respects it. And But he was the catalyst for me to do it. You know, so I want to be an example for somebody else. If Kevin can do it, man, I can do it. It may be an, a candy company. Who knows what it is? But if he can start from, from scratch with nothing, I know I can do it. This guy can do it because he's not that great. He just took a risk and went out there and did something, and it worked. Or it's working. So that's what I would say. My cousin was pretty much the guy that got me out there. It wasn't the military. It was my cousin. Yeah, just real fast. If anybody takes Kevin's advice and starts a candy company, let me know. Glad to be a tester. <laughs> um, yeah. So my mine was different i always talk about what a terrible transition i had and it was mostly of my own doing right i was living in germany was getting medically retired unexpectedly i don't know if they like had a briefing or not if they did i probably wasn't paying any attention i was probably freaking out about how i was going to move my family back to the states and you know what came next um but i can say you know i'm in dayton ohio Wright patterson is you know kind of the big anchor of the community here and they are doing a much better job today of you know pushing out those resources and you know i try to do my best to meet with the veterans who are kind of in that transition phase and thinking about the entrepreneurship i think kind of what everybody's done here right we've all been pretty open book like no one's giving away secret sauce but all the big picture stuff right we're just there to help one another and i think that's kind of what makes the veteran community so special around this area and it's glad to i'm glad to see the dod and the uh services kind of putting more emphasis on that entrepreneurship absolutely um barbara how about you what was your experience like so upon <clears throat> transitioning out we had a lot of briefings um i think that with for briefings with regards to um work following the military we had you know a resume briefing we had an interview briefing but that's about it i think everything it was at that point was pretty much geared to uh working as a gs civilian or or working for corporate uh, i do wish that there was something about starting a business just some basics just to spark an idea just to have something in the back of your head um, but we did we didn't get anything um, about that. Just you know your basic resume and interview skills. I would like to thank all of our veteran panelists for their service to our country. Thank you for sharing your stories, insights, and for your willingness to help other innovators and entrepreneurs find their path to success. We're going to take our last break now as we set up for our final panel. Please stand by. <laughs>